to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, Chef's Surprise. Will it be pigeon, rabbit or venison? We're out with sporting shooter game chef Mark Gilchrist planning this evening's menu. With his brand new Browning Maxxis semi-auto and export rifle, he's got all the bases covered. But first, first class transport, treatment and training for our working dogs. We visit the Duke of Buccleuse stately kennels. We're out with dog transport company Trans Canine. And we're hearing from some of the top dog trainers in the country. Plus, you could win a dog box worth more than £400. Working dogs come in all shapes and sizes. So do our cars. And that's when a company like Trans Canine comes in. Based in southwest Scotland, the company was started by Robert Marshall and his wife Sharon. They wanted to design a transit box that would be tough, secure, safe and built to fit your car. Even the boys in blue have got one. The design has been honed over time, but most importantly, it's all come about from a love of dogs and a love of shooting. I've myself personally been involved in around gun dogs for in the region of 35 years. I've been a shooter myself from the age of 15 and I've kept dogs all that time and obviously my background with the boarding kennels over the last 20 years as well has stood me in very good stead to understand the needs and priorities of the gun dog world. What sort of thing do you think they're looking for? Quite a demanding bunch, I'd have thought. They are a very demanding bunch. I think that's probably a little bit of an understatement. Um, but we can meet those demands. We have a, a, a quality product that's designed to last and last and last. The boxes themselves are made from aluminium, so therefore, for, from a longevity point of view, they will last indefinitely. As you know, there are 50-year-old Land Rovers running around in aluminium, and testimony to that is also the aviation use no industry use nothing but aluminium. So it's a good product for us to work with. It lasts well. It's in incredibly durable and uh, it, it, it does produce a quality product. Robert has invited us to look behind the scenes of the factory where his designs are developed, laser cut, painted and finally put together. We start really with an initial drawing that is done basically at our factory, brought here, um, and the product evolves from here. Go onto a CAD drawing, from a CAD drawing it's taken out to the factory floor, and in turn um, aluminium, a sheet of aluminium is then processed into a dog box basically. And um, as you'll see throughout the entire manufacturing process, again that quality word is very much emphasised throughout the entire process really culminating in the assembly point over here where final assembly is done and then the boxes are shipped from here to our warehousing and storage facility from where they're sent out throughout U the UK and uh, Europe and beyond. Some of the best dog trainers in the country use Trans Canine. We've been invited to the incredible kennels owned by the Duke of Buccleuch. The cockers, springers and very special labs are looked after and trained by David Lissett. He's won the odd championship or two, but he's a modest Scot, so let's talk about his passion. David's taken on the challenge of reinstating an historic bloodline. The reason that we're here is the Buccleuch Labrador. Historically, the bloodlines date back to the 1800s, and uh, the bloodlines in the Labrador you see behind us here, um, the bloodlines are unbroken back to 1836, I think it is, and they came from Newfoundland. So seven years ago, I was a self-employed joiner, and um, the and then there was an opportunity to come to the kennels and revamp the Buccleo Labradors. Unfortunately, we were down to one female, uh, Millie was her name, and she was six. So it was really very important that they, they took action, the family took action at that particular time, or the bloodlines would have been lost forever. So when I came here, we had Millie, and we started taking, uh, we started taking a few litters from Millie. We got Buccleo Opal, who was a field trial champion, and Buccleo Oak, who was uh, a field trial winner. 
So that was two that we got from Millie and the bloodlines have came from that. But there used to be 130 dogs on the Clue Estates, so you can only imagine the volume of dogs looking after them. All the keepers had them on the estate, so historically this is a whole reason that probably my position has came, has came up. In between times, with competing with the Beclue Labradors, we've been competing with Spaniels and Cocker Spaniels. And uh, we've had um, quite a bit of success in both. Um, and we do teaching, teaching clinics and training days um, in the UK and abroad. So going for a join or coming to this has been really quite an experience and a very enjoyable one, I must, ad must add, working for the family and the Beclue, the Beclue team. David Lissett, you know, to be fair, from a gun dog point of view, in a footballing term, it's, it's like having David Beckham signing off your dog boxes. There's nobody in the country more experienced or has achieved more in a short space of time than David Lissett. Um, not only is he a thoroughly nice chap, he has a wealth of experience. He has a super pedigree of his own, four-time Spaniel Championship winner. Um, he knows his dogs and he knows what he wants from a, a product, dog boxes in particular. Also here today are the two Andes, both respected gun dog trainers. They use Robert's transit boxes for their dogs. Well, over the years I've tried everything from homemade ones to different, different ones from different companies. Uh, and this one is definitely the best that I've ever had. Uh, they're very, very durable. You can wash them out. If you get a dog that's travel sick, uh, you can hose it all out and it's clean within five minutes. Um, you can leave them outside. This one is actually the model that you can uh, leave outside. It's weatherproof with the uh, weatherproof front on. Um, keeps the dogs really clean and dry and, and happy. Yeah. The time and effort that you put into training one of these dogs, even financially, if it's not worth a lot of money, it's always worth a lot to you. Um, and if you do have a, a crash, God forbid, then most importantly, you want the dogs to be safe. Yeah, so that's a major concern. Andy Cullen is from Leochin Gun Dogs. We do train in Persia. We, we live on uh, Cromlick's estate, which was famous years ago for uh, gun dog training. Uh, I actually, I, I try to train all types of gun dog for all types of people, really. And uh, in the end result, for people to go out into the shooting field with a Leochin trained dog, you know, well behaved, disciplined, that's all we ask for, really. Do people comment when they see a box like that? They actually do, uh, because how, how it looks, you know, that, that actually appeals to folk, because it doesn't look, you know, we've all been there, I started off with the wooden boxes in my time, you know, and it looks a wee bit weather beaten after a certain amount of time, but obviously that, as I say, is a year old and it still looks as if it's brand new, so that does make an impact, yeah. Back at base, Sharon is looking after the phones and the customers. She feels that one of their strengths is making sure people are satisfied with the product and the service complete total faith in it we've designed them um, as you've seen we've we've got the manufacturing all sorted and we're completely confident with our product and we've got lots of happy customers lots of people come back to us when they change their cars or they get more dogs or they get less dogs change their circumstances come back to us for other boxes refer their family and friends so yeah we're really really happy with the product in the warehouse Robert is installing the latest transit box Many hours testing, designing, back of envelope and Weedabix pack sketches have gone into creating a product that he's very proud of. We have, we have a, a product that is ripe not only for the gun dog world, I and mean, the gun dog world is a very important sector of our business, but we also supply boxes within the security sector directly to police dog handlers. And again, these are all people who are very demanding people, and they're using the boxes on a daily basis, as well as literally thousands and thousands of domestic dog owners. They're, they are durable, I've used that word before, but they are incredibly durable and are designed to last. They also, further down the road, not only fit the car you've bought the box and originally for, they will fit at least four or five other vehicles, so hopefully the chances are if you need to change your car in the future, you're not going to have to change your box. Now the competition. If you would like to win one of these trans canine dog boxes worth more than £400, what you need to do is email us a photo of your working dog doing what he or she does best and Tell us a shaggy dog story about that particular day. We'll get a professional field sports photographer to judge the entries and the winner will be announced on the Trans Canine Stand at the CLA Game Fair in the summer. Please send your entry to charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv If you want more information about the dog boxes, go to www.transcanine.com 
And if you'd like to find out more about training gun dogs with Andy Cullen, go to www.leochingundogs.com. And with Andy Platt, www.nithvalley.co.uk. Since starting Field Sports Channel, we've been lucky enough to go out with some exceptional stalkers and film some incredible deer. We've chosen the best of the bunch and are releasing our first deer stalking DVD, A Year of Deer, 12 Months, 6 Species. It's stuffed with great advice and great stories. There's the fallow stalk with the added excitement of an aggressive dog walker throwing abuse as we take out an injured buck. Rugby league legend Kieran Cunningham describes his first red as being better than scoring at Wembley, and he should know. There's also a masterclass in calling in those roebucks and grallicking a Chinese water deer. It amounts to more than an hour and a half of some of the best action in the field. Go to the new shop page on the front of the www.fieldsportschannel.tv website to order. Now, sporting shooter chef Mark Gilchrist has got hungry diners to feed. He's not going to go up Asda with a shopping trolley. He's taking a shotgun and a rifle and he's going to his own personal Asda, the British countryside. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. I'm Mark Gilchrist and today I've got three or four guns from Browning and I'm going to hopefully be putting them to the test. We've got a local farmer who very kindly has said that he's got some problems with pigeons, rabbits and deer. So depending on the time we're going to see what he wants done first and we're going to hopefully shoot some deer, some rabbits and some pigeons. I'm here at the Oxford Gun Company. I'm going to put the Browning Maxis together, give it a go and see if a useless shot like me can break some clays with it. Oh! First thing you need to notice, how easy it is to get the fore end off. Like that. So you don't have to unscrew it, just take it off. Very quick to assemble. Slide it in. When I picked it up from Browning, they told me to mention just how easy it is to take apart for ease of cleaning and they said it exactly like that, which I think is probably a hint, having seen the state of most of my shotguns get in. Um, just some of the key features you want to notice on a Maxus. When you get it, if you look in the, uh, in the box, they've got spaces for here and here, so you can make it fit yourself. Um, and my first gun that I tried to modify myself is now um, completely unusable because I super glued wood on the end, which is not a good idea. But you don't have to do that because they've got spaces for there and there, and you can file them for cast off if you need it. Oh, uh, the other thing I, I really like about it, which some people might think is a little silly, it's got quite a nice high rib on it. And if, like me, you have to shut one eye, if you're shooting under the moon, you can still see plenty of the bird around the barrel. So as I do that, all I'm seeing is I'm looking down the rib rather than the barrel. Um, and I took this out under the moon, had a very good evening flight with my dad uh, under the moon at the Widgeon up in Essex. Um, we picked up. 57 duck and I put it down to being able to see the bird more clearly under the moon with one eye if that makes any sense. So you've got more light coming into your eye so you can read the bird better. Now one of the other key features I really like is that I've got cartridge in the magazine but there's nothing in the chamber and I know it's safe so if I'm, if I'm in a hide on my own I know I've got an unloaded gun but when I see something coming all you have to do is work the bolt bang on the dead pigeon so you don't have to touch any buttons just work the bolt and you've got a cartridge automatically fed in so it's a, a nice feature if you like operating a safe hide to pick up a gun quickly loaded you can do it all in one motion pull the trigger hopefully another dead pigeon with the maxis firing on all cylinders it's time to zero the expert in the hope we might see some deer this evening the farmer has told mark there's a chance of rogue fallow and muntjac Right, now we've got a Browning X Bolt 243 that I've just been given my Browning to have a go with. We've got some Winchester silver tip bullets and the first thing we need to do before we have a go at the deer this afternoon is zero it. I've got a box out there with some weight in it, uh, just 25 yards away. We'll put a couple of bullets into it uh, and try and get a rough zero and then I'll move it out to 100 yards. With the 243, I like to see it shooting an inch high at 100 yards and that, if you look at the curves, that gives you the best accuracy over distance, I hopefully won't be shooting at anything that far away, but if we need to, we can. So we'll just put a couple of rounds in the magazine, 
and give it a go. So I've just done a test shot and it's um, about ooh, six inches to the right and six inches low. So what I've got to do now is, is move the crosshairs so that we get it bang on at this range. So then when we go further out, all we're doing is fine tuning it. Woohoo! Right, that bullet is bang on at 25 yards, which don't want to overcapitalize on one of life's small victories because it's not that successful. So what we need to do now is get it bang on or an inch high at 100 yards. Then we know that anything between 20 yards and 100 yards is going to be dead. So the bullet will go exactly where we want it to go. So we've done the 25, now we're going to move it out to 100 and see if I can get a nice group at 100 yards. Right, I've tracked my shots down at longer ranges and I should now have a three shot group and I'll point out which bullets were which. What you want to do if you're doing it at home is put a little circle around them and put a number. So you can, you can watch your bullets, one, two, three, four. I've done it mentally. It's not really the best way because you tend to forget and then you think, was it that bullet or that bullet I just did? Okay, I'm hoping we've got a nice little group just above the target area. Okay. That was my first shot there. Okay. This is the next one I did. Then I had a re-zero. I did it there and then these are, this is my three shot group so I'm going to give it a couple of clicks to, 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 give, to make the bullets come to the right and that is a perfect shot for me it's an inch high it's 60 70 yards it's not even an inch high because that group the center of that group is about there so that'll come over to there and okay if we can be that accurate at that range with a target area like that we're going to safely take the deer out first second third and that's my final three shot group. So it just needs to come over and we're in. Time to say our goodbyes to David Florent at the Oxford Gun Company and find our farmer. But there's a pigeon problem. Unfortunately, not the good kind. There aren't any. They're on grass and there's no chance of decoying them today. There are some crows in the farmyard. They too are reluctant to play ball. We're starting to get a bad feeling about today, especially as the herd of about 40 deer that were lying up under a big oak just a few hundred yards away was disturbed moments before we were about to head into them. Hopefully, Mark has a plan B. What's happened since we zeroed the rifle in is we, we've got a phone call from a farmer saying we've got fallow deer out in the field. Um, obviously, I was a little bit excited. They're all lying down. I thought, great, we'll be able to go out, hopefully get one or two, uh, film the whole thing in daylight and uh, you know it'd be great footage we all got pretty excited we've turned up at the farm and uh, the farmer's son has zeroed his 243 in next door to where the fallow are okay so the fallow obviously got up and left and went back to the wood now i'm not <laughs> too optimistic um, of them coming back out but we do have muntjac and roe here um, so we've got a chance and what we've done is we've come to the far end of the farm and the, the farm is sort of shaped in a, in a block like an elongated oblong and the deer move left to right so what we're going to try and do is we've come down here early and we're hoping that our scent will have dissipated uh, and it, it's a forlorn hope but it's you know it's a chance and I'm going to wait here until it's really sort of quite close to dark and then I'm going to creep up into the wind sort of across the deer path so to speak, I think we our chances have moved from a dead sir to you know maybe one in three. Um, but you know that's deer stalking and that's farmers and uh, when you you know graciously accept permission from the farmer, you put up with these limitations. If you don't want to accept put up with these limitations, then you have to take a lease out and spend lots of money and. Um, this is a grace and favour exercise and it's one of those things. Uh, also, you know, some people would probably have thought, oh, you know, it's ruined, I'm going to go home, I'm not going to waste my time. 
um, I want to show willing and I want to show that to this farmer that I'm keen to come back and keen to do it properly um, so I'm going to go uh, and give it a go this evening even though I know the chances aren't good as we enjoy the hares in the distance Mark can tell us about the expulse very sweet shooting rifle handles very well um, it's definitely the sort of rifle that I want in my cabinet um, in fact I've asked them when I've got to give it back and send me a 3006 uh, exactly the same rifle because I'm very impressed with the way it performs um, it's a very reasonable rifle I mean I think you get very good value for money with it um, it's got a lot of features that I, I think are very sensible you can open the bolt when the weapon is safe by pushing a button on the bolt which I think is a um, a very good idea. I don't like rifles where you've got to make them dangerous to activate the bolt. I think that's you know, bad design. Uh, the X-Bolt doesn't have that. Um, got a very nice moderator on the front and we've got one of these Browning straps which actually I was really really impressed with. I went in and spoke to the, the to Browning and I saw another rifle with a strap and said can I have one of those straps. Um, just a decent strap but it has got an extra space for the three bullets there, which I always think is a very useful thing um, to have, and they're all sort of in the right place to, to get easy access. Suddenly, a ray of hope. A deer, but it's a roebuck. Out of season. Again, our hopes are dashed, but at least it shows some promise. We head along the hedgerow to the wood. Mark is right. The deer are heading from right to left, and we spot some fallow in the twilight. Eventually it's just too dark, even with a cloudless sky, and we head back to the cars. It's been a frustrating day, but an enjoyable one. It's a good job Mark isn't entertaining tonight. You know, on the flip side, we did see some row and, and another three fallow. Uh, I would have really imagined that we'd see nothing, so um, it wasn't a completely wasted evening. Also, you know, it's the first time I've stalked the ground, so now I'm fairly sure that uh, all the deer go between the two blocks of woods, so across the ground. So I've got some information for next time, and um, you know, I made the effort. So hopefully, the farmer will then let me come again because he, he knows that I'm someone that will put the time in, even when the conditions are bad. So all in all, a little bit frustrating, but uh, still a very enjoyable day. And that's what's so glorious about our sport. When it goes wrong, we learn for the next time. And when it goes right, there's nothing quite as satisfying. Well, we're back next week. This has been Field Sports Britain. Don't forget to enter our competition with pictures of your dog. <laughs>